Hello, everyone. How's everyone doing? Good. We're in the home stretch. Another couple of sessions. Thank you so much for sticking around. I am guaranteeing you that this is going to be an insightful discussion. So in my job as senior editor, I've had sort of a front row seat to all of the chaotic change that's happened over the last three years. And I have been particularly impressed with the role of HR and how that has changed over the past three years. And I was starting to go through sort of the things that you all focus on and what is changing. And I came up with this list, data-driven decision-making, technology integration, hello AI, employee well-being, DEI initiatives, not to mention remote hiring and employee engagement, and adapting to changing work modes. Who's exhausted? Show of hands? Burnout? <laughs> Tired? Yes, there we go. So anyway, we've assembled this amazing panel that are going to talk about exactly how their roles have changed and what they're doing right now for best practices. I'd like them to introduce themselves and tell us briefly about your work, and then just tell me broad view of how your role has changed over the last three years. Singleton, let's start with you. So um, thanks for having us. I'm Singleton Beato. I'm the Global Chief Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Officer at McCann World Group. And um, in terms of my role, I'm really in charge of setting strategic direction and vision for all matters that relate to diversity, equity, and inclusion for my global organization. And really, my biggest focus is on uh, providing leadership and guidance to our executives uh, to ensure that the work that we do is um, shared and that there is the right type of accountability for that work. Uh, in terms of how my role has changed, I would say fundamentally the role has not changed because the challenge is what the challenge is. Uh, I think that what has shifted is, or I want to say expanded, is the responsibility to really up my game as a business leader and be very um, broad in my discussion and in my thinking around how we define diversity, equity, inclusion in a way that allows the masses of employees that we have to feel a sense of ownership in driving the change that we want to see. Um, and in also making sure that the way in which we communicate the point and purpose of this work is at once um, compelling, data-based, and, um, and inspiring. You know, because a lot of times we see that change happens when people are inspired to be a part of. So I would say those are the, the ways that my, my job has changed. Hi, everyone. My name is Savona Blake. Um, I oversee campus diversity for city. Um, in my role, um, a lot of it has to deal with strategy of understanding the needs of the business, um, understanding the needs of our various stakeholder, uh, stakeholders, so that includes our talent partners, um, as well as students, um, which is an interesting aspect um, to deal with, but a very important one. Um, I'm also responsible for our various programs that we have for early careers within city, um, as well as managing partnerships with different diversity organizations um, in schools and universities. Um, and how my role has changed, um, similar, um, similar to um, my colleague here, um, I would say um, it just has more so expanded. Um, so the way that we're doing business has expanded. Um, we're looking at what the needs are, um, ensuring that we're just expanding on them, um, that we're being more purposeful on them, um, that we're meeting the needs of the future generation that is coming in um, as we see um, differences within um, the workplace and how things are changing. Thank you. Yes. 
Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I uh, want to thank the team at day one for putting together this uh, event today and for uh, including us in this conversation. I'm super excited to be uh, with my fellow panelists here. Uh, I'm Ramses Jean-Louis. I go by Ramses and I go by Ram. I'm the uh, Chief Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Officer at Pfizer. Uh, I've been at Pfizer for two years. Prior to that, I was leading diversity, equity, and inclusion at Verizon uh, and then at Comcast NBC Universal before that. With regards to answering the question, I think the way I approach diversity, equity, and inclusion is pretty much the same and pretty consistent. I try to be as transparent as possible, be as inclusive as possible. I'm a firm believer that you know, if you're as inclusive as possible and if you create things as accessible as possible, you make things more digestible for all. Uh, so I'm a firm believer of that and that has served me well. I would just say overall, how have I seen diversity, equity, inclusion change over the last three years? I would say, you know, we, do, we all recognize three years ago when we were looking at Breonna Taylor and the murder of George Floyd, that uh, there was a lot going on in our country and in our history. And I think from a diversity, equity, inclusion perspective, we were heroes. We were heroes because we were helping our organizations, our company, and the nation navigate a very complicated situation from a social standpoint, from a corporate standpoint. I, ab I absolutely love the fact that when you take a look at our colleagues, and when you take a look at our employees at different organizations, they were holding us accountable for really speaking up. And again, you know, the belief was uh, you know, silence is violence. You're complicit if you're not speaking up and really being active in being a part of the change that we all seek. You know, I would say you know, after that period, there was a period where all of a sudden diversity, equity, inclusion, and PX professionals, people experience, HR folks, were pulled into some conversations that we weren't traditionally pulled into. We were pulled into investor relations meeting, meeting with shareholders, having conversations about you know, what should be shared and what should we talk about during our earnings calls. One of the things I'm especially proud of is being innovative in the DEI space. You know, let's talk about DEI, not at DEI conferences, but let's talk about it during our earnings call. So we were able to do all that. So I think we moved from being heroes at one point to looking at it now a couple of months ago. I got up in the morning and I found out that we were being accused of and being held responsible for bank failures. I believe it was Silicon Valley Bank that said it was because they were doing too much diversity, equity, inclusion yeah. that was taking place. I mean, because we all know that CEOs pay much more attention to chief diversity that's officers right. than their CFOs. So that's, yeah. that must have been the reason why it happened. So I, I think we have to be realistic. There's been some headwind changes that has taken place in the space of diversity, equity, inclusion. But at the end of the day, let's face it, when we're talking about the fight for racial equity and gender equity and, and advocacy, for people with disabilities in the LGBTQ community and refugee populations, that's always faced headwinds. And more likely than not, probably in my lifetime, it'll probably face headwinds in the future as well. What we need to do is just continue to be steadfast and steady and continue to advocate and, and you know, help people get out of their own way, so to speak. There's a little bit of fear that I think that's taking place. You know, we're all familiar with the don't say gay if you're down in certain parts yeah. of the country. <laughs> now you kind of feel like it's don't say the D word. Don't, don't, let's not, let's call it something else. Let's not run away from it. Representation matters. It yes. always has mattered. It will continue to matter. Let's continue to embrace it. And of course, we're going to be inclusive, but we're always going to address statistical significant differences and come up with solutions where we're creating opportunity for all. Thank you. I definitely want to unpack this. You kind of teed up my next question, so thanks for that. But let's have Michael go next. All right. Thanks, Lydia. Um, yep, happy to be here. So I'm the co-founder and CEO of Torque. Uh, Torque is a global professional network of software developers um, and a digital platform that connects them to companies that are looking to attract them, engage them, and eventually hire them um, as contractors or freelance talent. And um, to your question, so I, I've been in this uh, remote workspace since 2001. And so early it, the adopter. early adopter. So that, that, you know, the last three years, like that part of it wasn't new um, to me. This, in fact, this is my third company that I built on top of kind of a remote software developer community. And um, but what has changed is all of the companies that we work with have been kind of forced or fast forwarded into this whole world of remote work. Um, and for the most part, you know, at the beginning, they kind of all didn't do it very well. They kind of stunk at it. Um, over the last three years, some have gotten better at it, a lot have not. 
And what we've realized as, a, as an organization, Torque, is we can help companies do that. We can teach them how to do remote because it, it requires a lot of process, it requires a lot of technology, a lot of tools, um, requires a lot of metrics, it requires a lot of learning how to run a culture in a remote, remote world. And um, I'd say that's a lot of the expertise that we've learned over the years and we're bringing to our customers. Thank you for that. Um, so I wanted to, is this on? I wanted to go back to the DEI evolution because you teed up this trend. It was important, important, important. Companies were hiring DEI executives at a rapid clip. And then all of a sudden, Public memory fades. Third anniversary of George Floyd. Nobody's talking about it anymore. Other equity issues kind of slipping away. So Singleton, you and I had talked earlier about this. What is the role now in a place where we are seeing a de-emphasizing of DEI? OK, so people are hearing me call this the great rollback. Mm -hmm because all the declarations that happened and all the commitments that happened, um, you know, it seems that a lot of it was reactionary. Now this makes all the sense in the world. We, we react as a society to things, in particular things that are crisis oriented. And the result of what happened in 2020 was a crisis for business leaders. Um, and as long as there was public discourse and pressure and accountability from the masses that were in their affected state to continue to prove their commitment as leaders, as long as that was happening, then we were the heroes. We were the people that needed to be present in all those key and critical conversations. Um, what we have seen now is what we've seen many, many times throughout our lifetime, our parents' lifetimes. Culture shifts. There is an ebb and flow to a lot of the issues that continue to plague us in this space, particularly as it pertains to equity. In this country, particularly as it pertains to people of color. And, um, and it just sort of expands from there to underrepresented groups, all finding their voice in that moment to say, wait a minute, we just, so many of us are in this, in this situation and we need to hold businesses and business leaders accountable. Some of that also is because um, the, there are several studies that say that uh, the public believes that businesses have greater power than government bodies to drive change, greater influence and everything else. Um, what has happened is the knock-on effect of that convergence of crises has hit our proverbial pockets, yeah. right? That's happened for those of us with those kitchen table issues. That's happened with business leaders that are looking at um, a not great projection when it comes to how they're going to be able to generate revenue and be profitable and things right. like that. So like anything else that happens in a business, they focus on what is crisis and critical and then everything else, everything else tends to fade out of focus. This issue in particular is also associated with a series of pain points mm -hmm. that people didn't want to deal with to begin with. Right. So when you bring all that together, you have the great rollback. It's like we can roll back because you guys are really far more interested in whether or not you can afford your stuff, right? So we just gonna put these other issues over here on the shelf for a little while. We're still talking about it, but it's just over here because we're gonna solve these bigger problems for you. Can everybody in society agree to those priorities? And so with everybody in society also, we're all dealing with our stuff, we sort of allow that to happen. Right. And it will be the next crisis that happens that has to do with the DE&I in some way. And, and um, 
you know, I've read a lot of reports that talk about the rate of change, right? So maybe what took 10 years to a social uprising, then was five years to a social uprising, is now going to be more like 18 months, right? right? And so what will happen is those business leaders that said, oh my god, there is racism in America. We cannot believe this. And we need to address it. And we need to do it now. And we need to put millions of dollars behind it. They won't be able to say that the next time. Right. Right? But the next time is coming in short order. Well, so your DEI executives, it's on you to kind of stay the course? It's on so us that. to help our leaders stay the course. And it's on us to help them from a quantitative and qualitative perspective, mm -hmm. understand what is at risk with the business if and when this period comes to the fore again and, and all of the progress and commitments mm -hmm. are not solved for. One of the things that I've noticed is that as the focus was on all of these DEI initiatives, certain things in the talent space started really changing more rapidly. And one of those things was, if we're trying to be more inclusive with hiring, we're going to ditch the four-year degree. And it's become destigmatized. And job descriptions don't necessarily have requires a college degree. So that was a significant change, I thought, especially because I'm 105 years old, and if you didn't have a four-year degree, there was no way you were going to get any sort of a white-collar job, if we're calling them that. So um, Savona, I wanted to ask you, um, the companies are trying to be more inclusive. So how do you feel about that trend, and what is City doing specifically? Yeah, I definitely think that's an important trend, especially as we see um, the work environment change a as a whole. Um, so City, one thing that we focus on is one, we have a bigger focus on community colleges than we ever have before, um, so that we can meet students where they're at, especially as COVID um, you know, has come about and students are kind of changing the way of traditionally going to school. Um, it's important for us to meet those students where they're at to educate and expose them um, where they're at regardless, as well as partner with organizations um, that already do that work. Um, so we, there's no need to really reinvent the needle, but partner with organizations and support those um, that are already doing the work so that we can educate students, on, I'm sorry, educate early career workers on um, you know, how to get a job within corporate America without having a four-year degree. Because um, to be honest with you, a lot of times when we get into these roles, we're relearning everything anyway. We're not really using a lot of our degree um, to even do these roles. A lot of this stuff can be taught. Um, so if we can meet um, early career workers who are not you know, getting the traditional four-year degree where they're at by partnering with various organizations, going to various community colleges, um, and exposing them through that, um, that really has been how City has been de-emphasizing, but I think it's a great opportunity mm -hmm. um, to do so, and I'm really excited to see us doing this. Did you want to add? Uh, so I actually, I love stats. I have a couple stats on oh, this, so I'll just share them. Oh, please do. So, I love a good stat. <laughs> um, the, uh, we're in a skills-based economy right now, mm -hmm. so particularly in the field that we're in, software development, and um, I was, I, SIA published a report, and the research showed that um, that talent was 5x more predictive to be successful based on skills versus their college education, right? They were 2x more successful based on um, skills versus work experience. Mm -hmm. And if you look at, here's the proof is in the pudding, if you look at from January 2022 to January 2023, uh, the number of jobs requiring a four-year degree on Indeed shrunk by 37%. So it's happening. Yeah, and, and I think that's terrific because I'm a big proponent of skills. And I also, if you've heard me speak before, I don't believe soft skills are soft skills. I believe they're power skills. And those are the kinds of things that you can teach, but you can see those in people. And if you're able to, draw them out so that they could be the most successful version of themselves. But Ramses, I wanted to sort of follow on to this concept you can bring diverse talent in the door. You could bring underrepresented groups in the door. 
You can bring people without four-year degrees in the door. But once they get there, you have to make them feel like they belong, and you have to help them advance their career. So can you talk a little bit about best practices for doing that? A a absolutely. And, and first, I'd like to you know, commend Savona and, and Michael for you know, advocating for skills uh, versus schools. I love that movement. That's something that we believe in. So we've taken out the four-year degree uh, at our organization as well. That's helped us in so many different places. That's helped us with our military hiring, just in general, because you want to approach that a little differently when you're looking at bringing in these very senior leaders that will do an outstanding job within your organization. That's also helped us with regard to our refugee leadership initiative. You know, we want to be inclusive on all dimensions. So we've come up with some outcome metrics for ourselves in terms of in 2022, we had a goal of hiring 100 refugees. We exceeded that goal. Now we decided to add an additional 500 for a total of 600 refugees that we want to hire by 2025. And we added another 100 in Europe as well. And, and when we take a look at, you know, how some of our refugees come here to this country, we're not only onboarding them into our organization, but into the country as well. You know, especially some of the refugees that we had from Afghanistan, they're coming in and they don't even have proof of their credentials. Oftentimes yeah, they yeah. come with the clothes on their back and not even a suitcase. So again, taking all of that into consideration, we've been doing that for the last couple of years. And I'm proud to say that some of our initial hires have since been promoted. So going directly to the question that you mentioned, it's more than just creating an opportunity for people to be considered. But what are you doing with all of that great talent once you get them in the door and once you get them into the organization as well? So it's important to have a holistic approach. And I like, you know, the, the framework that you've created, because I think those are the questions that we always have to be asking ourselves in general in terms of, you know, the talent pool that we're creating. Is it diverse enough? You know, that's the first question. And if the answer is yes, but you find that you're still not getting that representation within the company, then you might need to work on some other things. Do we need to work on education and awareness opportunities better? Going beyond just unconscious bias training. I know everybody likes to roll out some unconscious bias training, but let's talk about what conscious inclusion looks like. Let's talk about you know, accountability. Let's talk about, as opposed to having bolted on type of learnings, how do we integrate it so that it's just in time training when you're doing performance review? Let's take all of that into consideration. How do we leverage artificial intelligence so that this way hiring managers can continually get insights when they're doing performance reviews to be like, hey, let's take a look. It appears as if you've ranked all of your male people on your team a little higher than the females on your team. It seems as if you know, you've, you've ranked some, uh, some, some folks in your Australia office a little higher than, so having all of those insights are really important, but really making sure that it's integrated overall in what that diversity, equity, inclusion conversation looks like. So again, we're looking at you know, not only how we're bringing people in, what are we doing when they're here as well, how are we creating opportunities for growth, and are we creating zigzag opportunities? Yes. Within our organization, you know, one of the requirements for you to be considered for another opportunity is that you don't necessarily need to have any experience doing that. So again, you're giving people tradi who traditionally maybe have had an obstacle getting into certain areas a, a leg up in terms of there's different things that you could do. You could do a stretch assignment. We have gigs within our organization. We have, uh, we have uh, secondments that you can do. You can dedicate 50% of your time or you could dedicate 100% of your time for a year depending, you know, if you've worked it out with your hiring manager. So creating all of those opportunities so people can actually build up those skills so they could be considered for opportunities at a later time. Yeah, that's super important. Um, and I think that the assessments that you mentioned are also important because you have to know what's missing in certain departments, certain skill sets in order to move people forward. But sometimes those gaps can't be filled by who you have there. So that's where the contingent workforce comes in. And I know that when we all went remote, or most of us, um, three years ago, the entire world of talent opened up to us. And people could work from anywhere, so that was great. But also, we had a lot of people who were temporary workers that came in to fill those gaps. So Michael, I want you to talk about uh, how you can assess for those gaps, how you get that contingent workforce in. Sure. So, um, you know, I know we were all fast forward into this whole, you know, contingent or different way of working, mm -hmm. but this trend has been happening for the last 10 years and it's been driven more by the talent than by anything else. Um, okay. So the, the talent has wanted to move this way. Um, and particularly in, you know, in the fields that, that I specialize in, in the software field, 
it's um, it's because that's where they're they have so much opportunity and they have so much choice that companies have to actually start looking at things a little bit differently. It's not like you know previously it's like oh well hey I feel bad if I only have a month's worth of work or two months worth of work right. three months worth of work or after three months I'm not going to need that skill set again. So so oh, instead of finding that skill set I'm going to take somebody else and kind of teach them it and you know get the make the best out of it. In reality. No, that's better. Like the talent has plenty of opportunities. You would be doing people a favor um, if you start moving quicker to using fractional talent, using on demand. I mean, these aren't new concepts, right? Like, you know, just in time inventory. Okay, mm -hmm. that was like 1990s, right? I mean, <laughs> in, in, and it's just in time talent now. Mm -hmm. And platforms like Torque and plenty of other platforms give you the ability to pipe into that talent. You can bring them on as fractional. I actually encourage, I think, I, I tell a lot of my customers, I'm like, hey, go 20 hours a week. Like, you don't, you may not have full need for the data scientist, so go 20 hours a week. More often than not, they don't, because they're more afraid about what are they doing in those other 20 hours than, you know, like, it's, it's like, really? Like, is that, so is it like jealousy? We're talking about, like, teenage relationships here. Uh, but it's moving in that direction, and it's being driven by the talent. Um, they want to work on, they can be picky. Talent can be picky. If they're great at what they do, they should be choosing things that are, you know, the skills that they want to use, the industries they want to use them in, the places they want to work in, whether it's remote, whether it's on site, the missions they want to be a part of, right? And they can go and choose these things. So it, the quicker that companies and organizations adopt this just in time fractional, on-demand talent model, the better they're going to be and the more, the happier the talent will be. And I think platforms are, are I, I do think platforms are the answer to that because we have them covered. If somebody goes to work for a company for a month, we've got another nine months behind that. Mm -hmm. They're fine. They're not going to have a problem finding another gig, right? You know, and, and the risk is if you don't use them in the way they want to be used, they're going to leave. Yeah. And that's not good for anybody. That's, that's very true. And I think that, too, um, you know, when you work for a, a mission that you can get behind, it doesn't feel so much like work anymore. You want to be among people who share the same values. And, you know, if you can work at three places that match your values, more is the better, then, I guess. I, I love what I do. Yeah. And I wake up every morning, and what drives me is the stories of the talent that we're able to give amazing jobs to, mm -hmm. like working on technologies. So we, we have a lot of nearshore developers. We can give them access to work that there's no way they would have access to mm -hmm. where they live, where they grew up, and, and, and where they're working. And that's the stuff that drives me. Like, mm -hmm. that's the mission that, that I have. But um, yeah. Well, you mentioned platforms. Ramses mentioned AI. It's the AI elephant in the room, um, we, we got to talk about it. So here's the question. <laughs> Are you using it? If so, how? As we were speaking before we came out on stage, folks, you are not privy to this conversation. AI and HR has existed for a lot of years. Rate of adoption, not so much. So how are we using it right now? I'm going to go through all of you, so Singleton. Yeah, we're just starting. Well. Um, when it comes to um, our HR functions and administrative functions and things like that, um, we are starting to use it for kind of those mundane tasks mm -hmm. because none of us have the resources that we need on our teams. Sure. So whatever we can use AI for, that would be something that we don't need to put a lot of intelligence, per se, into. Right. We can cut our time, we're doing it. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of experimentation happening right now with creativity. Obviously, my business is creativity. Mm -hmm. And so there are teams all over our network that are looking at how AI can help, once again, to shortcut some of the work that takes a longer time to get to the point of a project or a, or a task or an assignment that truly requires that visionary thinking that only a human can provide. So right, right. we're in those initial phases. 
So yeah. For us as a firm, um, we are exploring it, but because we are in such a regulated industry, um, we're still like in the early, early adoption phases specifically for HR. So we haven't touched it too much as of yet. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm proud to say that we've, we've embraced AI. I mean, there's still a lot more that we can do, but I, I, I'm glad that, you know, when ChatGBT really became super popular, it wasn't one of those situations where we were telling folks, stay off of it. Mm. What we were doing was educating folks in terms of how do we use it responsibly? Yeah. Let's not go in there and dump company secrets into it. There's no type of protection, no type of firewalls. So I think over, over time, it started off with giving guidance in terms of how do you leverage tools that's outside. Now what we've done is we've created our own internal proprietary AI system. And again, early stages, so it's still growing, still developing, but we're seeing what we can build in-house and how do we complement it with other things as well. So still a, a lot of area to grow, but we recognize that when you look at AI overall, it's like a, AI is on the Acela train and we're like on the cargo train still trying to catch up. And we have a lot to do, but we're, we're moving in the right direction. I love the internal AI models. I think they're going to provide a big, um, a big leg up for companies that really dive into it. Um, we're a tech company. We use AI everywhere. We always have. I, what I've seen is the, you know, traditionally the definition of AI was uh, making decisions based off of data. Right? That was kind of a simple definition. Mm -hmm. Now I think it's moving into like computers acting as humans. Yeah. Right. It, it, truth, you they, know, they it, can talk to you now yeah, too. I mean, and uh, <laughs> and I do. So we we leverage it heavily. Um, I heard a quote last week that stuck with me, and, and I believe it wholeheartedly. I'm I'm a very much an optimist when it comes to technology. I think it's it's usually for the better. Um, but you know, the fear of hey, is this going to take my job away? And the quote said, uh, the quote was, the um, you're not going to lose your job because of AI, but you might lose your job. To the person that's using AI, yeah. right? And I think that's something we all have to kind of take in stride. Like that—that's true. Like in our industry, that's true. We arm our software developers and teach them how to use AI in their everyday life. It's inconclusive, but the improvements of productivity mm -hmm. are somewhere between zero and a hundred percent. But I can say a lot of people are are using it, yeah. um, and it's going to get better. That's. That's what technology does. Well, and just like with you know um, any sort of alcohol, like use responsibly, as Rams mm -hmm. has said, just we just need to think about how we're doing it and be really intentional. Um, so from one sticky conversation topic to another, the RTO debate continues to rage on, despite the fact that we've we know we can work remotely. We have proven that we can be productive when we're working remotely. Some people really thrive remotely. Other people, like my personal self, really love to be in the office. So let's talk a little bit about that. Um, I just want to watch our time. I have so many questions. I'm not going to get through them all. Um, how did the RTO debate impact your recruitment and retention efforts? Um, let's go back around. Let's do another round robin. So. Uh well, it does rage on, doesn't it? Yes, it does. <laughs> um, you know, listen, I think we are in a position where um, we're trying to make sure that we pay attention to how our policy is uh, being responded to. So in my company, we have moved to three days a week in the office. And um, that seems to be a good balance for most people. Um, it has become a challenge because some of the policies that took place during COVID that allowed us to recruit talent that lives somewhere else, which gave me a lot more in terms of diverse candidates, that has become an issue because now that we've said people need to be in the office three days a week, it's like, well, how do you make sure now that some of those people that you hired remotely right. that helped you with your diversity um, still feel that sense of connection, belonging, and shared purpose to what we do and in the work? So we're still kind of feeling it out and, and trying to figure out how we now shift our processes and our practices so that those folks still feel a part of and they don't miss out on any of those opportunities that you would get if you are in the workforce. Um, it's challenged our recruiting because 
we can no longer say, hey, we're going to recruit from all different places. So that's put a challenge there as well. Um, just quickly, I did meet someone just a couple days ago who had a great policy where he had his folks coming in four times a month, just four times a month. Everybody had to agree on what those four times a month were, but it allowed so many people to have that flexibility that they needed and to plan for those four days so that when everybody was in the office, they were actually together and using that time in a very constructive and meaningful way, so. Savannah. Yes, similar to um, Singleton, um, we are three days a week, um, which is quite flexible compared to a lot of our competitors. Um, the good thing is city has always had like a flexible work culture. Um, so work from home was not necessarily new when it came to COVID, um, but our CEO has noted that that will be like the standard, just we will always have like a flexible work um, space. So that is important. Um, you know, as we have people from across the world, we have 240,000 employees. Um, so of course wow. there, yes, a lot. <laughs> um, so of course there are a lot of folks who are still remote, but um, the general population um, is sitting at three days a week. Okay. Yeah, I, I think we are as well. We're like two to three days a week. And I do feel the same way from a diversity perspective. You know, we're talking about the type of recruitment that you could do with people with disabilities, people who have mobility issues. It just really opens up the door for you to consider a lot geographically, et cetera. But it's, it's interesting because I also think about, you know, the migration of where we've come from. So we've come from the great resignation to the great reimagination in terms of how do we think, you know, to make it worthwhile and make the employee value proposition. I read an article today that actually talked about, are we now in a time of the great mirage? Uh, meaning that now people are actually staying at their job a little longer because the job market is not as strong, mm. but employee engagement sentiment has gone down mm -hmm. in light of the fact that the return to the office has increased. So I, I do think, you know, when we're thinking about our colleagues and when we're thinking about our employees, we got to think about how we treat them during good times and during times where we may want something more from them in terms of coming to the office. We have to figure out how do we balance that out and make sure, because once you know the market changes and it shifts, if people can jump, they can jump. In fact, I think it also included a stat that you know more people are applying to open roles than ever before mm -hmm. in terms of the number of applications now. So again, we need to kind of keep an eye on the pulse of how people are feeling about some of these policy changes. And, and I recognize on the first to mention, you know, a lot of folks are like I'm super productive at home. There is a difference between individual productivity and team productivity, yeah. uh, just overall, and you got to balance that out. Well, coming from the all remote yeah, perspective. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, <laughs> you got you, nothing. They, listen to me if you dare on this one. Um, I, you know, there, there's the, you know, you have to be in the office 100%, which is a heavy command and control. And then there's the fully remote. And then there's somewhere in between, there's this hybrid, which I think is still a version of command and control. And um, I'm, I'm definitely a fully remote fan. Fully remote does not mean you don't get together. That, I mean, it's still, you know, we, we're fully remote. We get together every time we need to. Right, and, and that's at least quarterly, usually monthly. Some teams get together weekly. Um, so it's not precluding that you're still getting together and having in-person time together. Uh, but it, it so, so I'm definitely on that side of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. And I think that if you build your workforce supporting that side of the spectrum, the rest of it still works. Yeah. If you build it supporting in office, the right side does not work, right? So you should be thinking, you know, in, mine is a, um, is a remote first mindset, right? So how do I make my meetings work remotely? How do I make my talent work remotely? How do I make my productivity, my team tracking and all that stuff work remotely? And if you can, if you can do it on that side of it, you can enable the other side. Now, my industry and what I do is heavily, you know, you can't go and do drug manufacturing remotely, right? But you can build software remotely. So, you know, so like works. I said, I'm on that side. All right. Well, um, we have time for my lightning round, because we're almost done. <laughs> so looking ahead to 2024, if you could sum up in one word what the biggest opportunity for talent leaders is going to be, what would that be? <laughs> Singleton is making the most incredible faces. One word. Let's go. One Sorry word? With you. Yes. <laughs> biggest opportunity. Can't do one word. Um, one sentence. Invest 
time in your self-care and in your self-development because the higher your capacity, the better you can do for your organization and your leaders. Okay, that's good. Biggest opportunity. Um, going back to what Singleson said about the great rollout, um, I would probably say keep the foot on the gas. Okay, biggest opportunity. Ramses. I, I would say the employee value proposition. I think you know people want to work places where their values are reflected in the organization. So companies that you know are authentically true in their mission and their vision, and it resonates with folks, will do well. Empowerment is the word. Empower, empowering people with uh, flexibility, with uh, metrics, um, and with data that that I that identify how how they're performing. Amazing. Well, we did it. Okay. Singleton, Savona, Ramses, Michael. Thank you so much for spending the time with me. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.